Okay, welcome. We are going to continue with Mystery of the Covenant. I think this is going to be part 29. Uh, I'll have to check that out. It might be 28. Uh, But this is also Passover time, and so we're going to be doing communion today. Those of you who want to join us on DVD or, or CD... And you want to get together some uh, grape juice or wine and bread, unleavened bread, and join us, that would be great. We are going to, and we'll get to that in just a little bit, but right now I want us to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, which says, quote, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Certainly if Christ is in you, you are not a reprobate. In Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us we are to live and move And have our being. I think that is a fantastic spiritual mystery that many of us, in fact I would probably say all Christians really in in truth have little understanding of. And it is a glorious mystery of the gospel that we should have a deeper understanding of. And it does fit in with this series on the mystery of the covenant. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, Jesus Christ, writing His will, His plan, and His purposes within our heart. You can't get any more new covenant than that, can you, friends? So I hope with that alone, that adds a deeper dimension to covenant understanding. If some of you do not understand that, Well, you ought to be shouting right now. You ought to be excited. You ought to even be spiritually dancing on the floor. That's fine with me. Get some Pentecostalism in you over that one. That's great. Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, there is a spiritual connection. We must understand that spiritual connection. It's not just a fleshly thing. It's not just a racial thing, although it is in the covenant. It is in God's calling and purposes and whom he has chosen. But we do not want to forget that there has to be spiritual transformation. If we remain just physical, let me put it another way for this Israel message and Israel study and understanding If we remain Jacobites and we are not changed in this struggle, when you're born in this life and you remain as a first Adam state, the carnal state, let's say, and you don't realize there's something wrong here, and you are not struggling for a transformation, to seek a spiritual transformation, to know that there's something greater than just what we are, you're missing the point. When you say so, friends, there has to be something deeper spiritually. And there is. So, seek that spiritual connection. Seek that spiritual transformation that can only come through Jesus Christ. And that transformation is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let us turn now to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Who is his will? Obviously, it's Christ's will. So we are not born with 
Christ's will within us, are we? We have to pray that we might be filled with His will. Now, when you pray for His will to be given unto you, are you going to understand that will all at once? No. You... It is a transformation day by day, here a little and there a little. We are transformed as we pray and we seek Him and we we call upon that spiritual transformation. We call upon His will to be manifest within us. What is that? That is putting on the mind of Christ. As we put on His mind, we read His will, which is in His testaments here, we gain knowledge of His will, plan, and purposes. And as we gain in that knowledge, and we abide in His Word, because He is a living Word, that Word dissolves our carnality. That, That Word will seep in, and the, mind, the seed of Christ and the mind of Christ will start growing within us. And we will become new creatures in Him. Dare I say, sons of the living God. I want to become a son of God. I believe I am a son of God, but I am not... I'm not fully there yet. You are not fully there yet. We are in measure. But I know that I have to die to myself. That's why Paul says I die daily. There's a spiritual thing here. We have to die to our carnal lust, our carnal appetites, our fleshly appetites. That is at war with liberty. True, spiritual, Christ-centered liberty. That, that war of the flesh lusteth against that liberty of Christ. There is this struggle, a spiritual struggle, that we have to understand, and we have to be willing to endure to be overcomers in Him. And Paul asks us, and the scriptures ask us, to be overcomers in this, in this struggle, in this spiritual warfare that we do need to see and that we do need to understand. All right? That she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. As I like to say, I didn't say that. That's what the scriptures say, right? Don't blame me. I didn't say that. (laughs) Well, yeah, it's God's word. And I'm called upon to teach God's word. And hopefully, I'm not imparting to you carnal, fleshly things, but I'm imparting to you deep spiritual things of the spirit that we do need to understand. You know, I struggle in this life. You all struggle in this life. You feel that struggle in various ways, various shapes and various forms, and all that's going on in the world today. Sometimes we just get caught up in the political carnal. Sometimes we just get caught up in the economic carnal. And we are blinded to the fact that, in many cases, those are distractions. Are you listening? In many cases, those are distractions that keep us from pursuing the real warfare, the real spiritual change that must take place that we're reading about in this verse and other passages in the Bible, whereby we can grow spiritually and we can become spiritually mature individuals. Now, when we become spiritually mature individuals, are you listening? You, have, you start developing a desire for meat, the meat of God's Word. Many Christians cannot handle the meat. They have to stay on the milk. 
or they're being deceived to desire that milk. The milk is good. We all need that milk at first to grow as babes in Christ to grow up to desire that meat. And to stay healthy and strong, we need the meat of God's word. Now, we don't need the meat of, of the, what the media feeds us. We don't need the meat of what the Republicans are feeding us, or the progressives, or the Democrats, or the political process. We don't need the worldly meat, whatever shape, form it is, out there. As you grow spiritually, you should come to understand this and perceive this on your own. Yes, I pay attention to what the news is saying, but I listen on a different level, I think, now than what I used to listen and hear those things before. Okay, a lot of you caught on to that. Praise God for that. A lot of you caught on to that. That's important. So we need, though, to desire and to be filled with His will. That's why I love hearing His word, folks. It's This is the news. This is Christian Bible real news. It's all we need to hear. I'm going to give you an example. Hang in here. How many of you, in all the years that you've been listening to the media news, have benefited or progressed or changed, it's changed your life? It's so profound that you... You'll just never forget it. I was thinking about that the other day. And a friend of mine, he and I were sitting around talking about the news. And we both realized at the same time, after all these years of watching the news, what really have we learned? In what way have we really benefited from man's news? And it just kind of... We were awestruck. We were dumbfounded when we thought about it. And I ask you to think about that. But how many are desiring and think they have to have the nightly news or the daily news that they would hear on CBS, NBC, CNN, or Fox News even, or Glenn Beck even? I'm saying you can't Listen to those things. But I am saying, listen on a different level, if you're going to. I'm saying, major in God's Word. Absorb His will. Seek His will. And all these things shall be added unto you. Is that Scripture, or is that Scripture? It's Scripture. All these things, all... Yeah. What I'm suggesting to you, dear friends, is there's another world out there that our eyes have been blinded to that's there that we can walk in, live, and move, and have our being in. Forgive my language here, please, but the hell with this world. I don't need it. I'm not a part of it anymore. I'm a new creature of Jesus Christ. I'm a part of his kingdom, not Obama's kingdom. I'm not a part of the democratic kingdom. I'm not a part of this corrupted new American experience anymore. I love my nation, don't get me wrong. But there's a kingdom of God that's going to be the next world ruler. I'm going and I'm going to support that kingdom. I'm going to be ahead of the ball game. I may have missed out on a lot of my life, but I'm not going to get this one wrong. So I'm going to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Woo! Well, that's a new revelation. That gets me excited, folks. Well, if there's ever time to speak in tongues, right now I'm ready for it. <laughs> Whatever that is. I won't get into that. Just playing with you a little bit here. But it, you know, you don't understand what I mean. This is a good news of the gospel. It is good news that we're not told, exposed, or heard. Are we? And you know what? It's all possible because of Jesus Christ. 
It's all possible because of Jesus Christ. Oh, I love saying that. Thank you, Jesus. You're our Savior. You're our Redeemer. You're our Transformer. You're our Deliverer. You're our King. You're our Judge. You are our Lawgiver. I don't need the Supreme Court. I don't need the executive branch of government of man. I don't need our legislators, state or federal or local. I don't need them. I'm not a part of your kingdom. I'm not a part of your order of the ages. I'm a part of Christ's kingdom. I'm a servant of Christ. I'm here to serve His kingdom. I'm here to do the will for His kingdom. Wow. You know what? That's what the disciples did. That's what they all did. They went out there, not advocates of Caesar or of Herod or of whatever is going on in their day and time politically. They were advocates of the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. You want to talk about the rapture? Now hold on, don't make fun now. You want to talk about the rapture? There is a rapture. Now you won't understand this, and I hope I'm going to get to it when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway right now. It's the kingdom of God. You say, well, I don't understand that. I know you don't. But I like holding you in suspense, so I'm going to say it to you right now anyway and let you chew on it. All right. Verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the kingdom of God right there. I still haven't given you much on it, but I've given you a little bit more right there to chew on. Increasing in... in um, uh, philosophy of men, increasing in economics, in, in, increasing of the history of the world, increasing in sociology, increasing in eubonics, <laughs> whatever is going on out there that they're teaching in these universities. Oh, they're always pushing it. Spend your hard-earned money and send them to our Babylonian high school so your children can get a Babylonian education so they'll thumb their nose at you and the God Almighty and His Word. No thank you, world. Oh, well, they'll grow up not getting high-paying jobs. They won't excel in Babylon if you don't send them to Princeton and Columbia and be in Obama. Obama went to Columbia, see? Yeah, that's more reason why I don't want to send them there. I want my kids to, to increase in the knowledge of God. That's all they need. You mean they can become brilliant, smart, intelligent? Yes, without having um, the uh, going through the schools of man's higher learning. That what? That feed the adversaries are feeding our minds to make them adversarial against the kingdom of God. And they'll get out of there hating church, hating, well, some churches actually do need hated, I suppose, but yeah, they do. <coughs> Another story. But they, they will hate Christ. They'll start believing more and more in evolution. Now, that really takes some extreme dumbing down to believe in evolution. There's a lot of brilliant people, um, including, although he's not my idol, Bill Gates didn't get into college education. He did go to college for a while, but he didn't go finish it. There's lots of people who did not have a, quote, college education. I'm not saying that we can't be educated, but if you will major in the Word of God, dear friends, 
And you will pray. And you will be faithful to him and seek his will. And you seek his will on what to study, what to research. And God Almighty, and pray to him that Jesus, you help me excel in this area. I don't care if it's mathematics or history or grammar or to be a good writer. Don't we need good Christian writers out there? Or maybe it's even a minister to go on the gospel. Message and minister. I know it's not a um, well thought of profession today. For good reasons. There's whoremongers within the ministry out there. But there's a need for them. We need good Bible teachers out there. Amen? But he'll help you. And you will excel in God knowledge. For the kingdom of God. Strengthen with all might according to the glorious power unto all patience. you got to have patience. And long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father. Now think about this. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's light bearers. Being light bearers for the kingdom of God. The inheritance that we want to inherit is to rule and reign with Christ in His kingdom. To be light bearers of His kingdom. Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of the darkness. You know, if you're going to these man-made schools of atheism and antichristism and excelling in them, you're in the power of darkness. But says and had, but he hasn't done this for us. He had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He had tra- translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. This, if you want to believe in a rapture, this is the true rapture right here. Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. If that's your definition of rapture, then I believe in the rapture, baby. And so should you. It's the kingdom of God. And it's also Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't need anything else. Yeah, but you won't have a big house. and I may not. But I may have a big house. I may have a three-story mansion. I may have five boats. I know I'm being ridiculous here, but I'm saying, if God wants me to have that, it's fine. But I don't want those things. Let's just say God made those things available for me. Do you want them, Dave? Maybe it would be a question. I'm just speaking extemporaneously and foolishly. I don't want them. Well, Dave, what would you want? I would want wisdom above that of King Saul. What do you mean by that? I mean, I don't want 700 concubine wives. Do you? Anybody? Or men? He, He was... I don't know, I have to question his intelligence or his wisdom. Uh, Well, again, that's another story. But that's why I want wisdom above what he had. I don't desire those things. The more I get into Christ, and his kingdom grows within me, Christ grows within me, I don't want a lot of those things, do you? I love my family. I want to take care of my family. I want to be a blessing to my family and the body of Christ. I want the family of God and to be near the family of God. But these things of the world, really? Do I want the things of this world? How stupid it is for you hear these billionaires, millionaires and billionaires. They're, They're greedy. That's why it's hard for them, the Bible says, to enter the kingdom. They're greedy. 
You show me there's very few rich people who are not greedy. <coughs> now, there's rich people, I've noticed, that are well off, quote, rich, that are not millionaires or billionaires by any stretch of the imagination, but they're well off and they have money. And I notice that they use their money well. And they will start use it for the kingdom. But I've noticed that people that are rich, and I've met a lot of them over time, their heart's not for the kingdom of God. Very, very few of them. Very few of them. But here's the funny thing about it. I don't know how many of them I've known, and you hear about them, and you know them as well as I do. They died with their money and hoarding that money. And many times, the state or the federal government gets that money, and they decide what to do with it. Well, how stupid is that? Right? Where's their heart? And they think, well, I was a Christian, or I read the Bible, but they lived in fear of someone's going to get my money. Really? You're a billionaire or you're a millionaire, and you're worried about somebody getting your money? I don't know what it was recently. Donald Trump was on there, and they asked him, well, how much are you worth? He says, I don't know. I'm probably $9 uh, billion. He says, I'm poor compared to it. He left it off all these various billionaires. I'm like... Really? You're, uh, you're, you have nine billion dollars. Nine billion dollars. How many of you think you could get on well in life with a million? I do. If I had a million dollars, I wouldn't, I don't think, have any more financial real concerns. You say, oh, that's not much today. I understand what you're saying, but you're not listening to me still and thinking. Some of you are thinking on another level. Believe me, if I had a million dollars, I wouldn't have a financial concern. Because I don't need a lot of these things that the world thinks that they have to have. Do you follow me? Oh, you, want to, you have to have a big house, though. And you have to have a thousand acres. And you have to have this, and you have to have that, Pastor, don't you? No, I don't. I can be quite well and give to the kingdom work and be quite happy with not that much. But if you had two million, let's say, you got double that amount of a million, would that be enough for you? Well, I don't know. You get a little closer, but I don't know. Really, you don't know. Three million? Five million? Well, ten million, would you be happy? I think ten million, I might feel secure. Because I plan on going to Europe 20 times a year. And I'm going to stay in the most expensive hotels while I'm there. And I'm going to eat the most expensive lunches and go to the expensive entertainment things. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. When I die, I want all my money to show that I spent it all on worldly pleasures of Dave Barley. Or yourself put it in there. Really? That's what you want? That's the message you want to send? That's your love of the kingdom? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's so much abuse and greed out there, you know, Pastor. I'm not a part of that. It's all going to go for me. Really? How many of you think what I'm talking about is spiritual or not? I think it's very spiritual. Because it's real. There's people out there like that. Trust me. Where's our values? Is it in the kingdom of God? You know, I think oftentimes about Peter... And the disciples that he's with, person needed healing, couldn't walk. What did Peter say to him? Silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. How much is that worth to you? How much is that worth to you? How rich was Peter? I would say he is rich in the kingdom of God. 
why don't we see kingdom of God manifest more and more these days? Because most people are not in the kingdom of God. Their heart is not in the kingdom of God. Am I getting that loud enough? Their heart is not in the kingdom of God. I would like to think, and I believe it, that if God Almighty put $50 million in my hand right now, it would be used for the kingdom of God. It would be used for the kingdom of God. With a smile on my face. How can you say that? Because Christ is in me. Christ is in me. People talk about the spirit of patriotism. Spirit of patriotism is in me. So I'm going to run off to war in Iraq or Afghanistan and fight for freedom. They may have good intentions. And many of them have died and sacrificed much. I'm not making fun of that. But as a truth seeker, I have to say, they didn't die for Christ and His kingdom. They didn't suffer for Christ and His kingdom. They were suffering for the new world order and those that are financing that war and publicizing that war for their own self-serving ends. Now, there's Christian martyrs who have died for the the, uh, cross and for Christ and His kingdom. They were tortured for the faith. They were burned for the faith. They were crucified upside down. They were beheaded. John the Baptist was beheaded, was he not? They suffered and died for the kingdom. Do you think they're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ? There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever they paid the ultimate price. They had the faith of Abraham. We have to have that same faith as well. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness. Hallelujah. Deliver us from the power of darkness, Jesus, and translate us into the kingdom of your dear Son. When Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan, he was involved in kingdom of God work. He was doing kingdom work. He was enlarging himself in the kingdom of God. People might think, well, I don't see the significance. It's not really significant. It isn't. Taking communion isn't significant. Yes, it is. It's all about signifying Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's all about kingdom. The kingdom of God being formed in and among His people. Having... A kingdom understanding that transcends what this world offers or or has. Transcends. It has a king, it has a land, it has a government, it has a law, it has a people, it has a purpose. It has all these things. But the world doesn't see them. The world doesn't understand it. But I find it awfully odd do you, that they hate Christians and they fear Christians? Why do they hate Christians and fear Christians? Let me hear an answer or two. Why do they, forget who they are, it doesn't matter. As far as I'm concerned, they could be a a white person. Because they can't get the kingdom. Okay, that's an answer. They can't get the Spirit of God. Okay, something else? Why do they hate and fear Christians, true Christians? They're also made that way by sin. Because they fear any aspect of the kingdom of God becoming, that we would have this awareness They fear 
Christians and the power of Christianity among Christians that are fully aware who the Savior and Redeemer is. They fear Christians who have an understanding, reverence for God's law. They won't obey God's law. They won't apply God's law. They want to live God's law. I'm not saying you're saved through the law. But they realize that all this works hand in hand, knowing who they are. They understand who their, what their true biblical identity is. They're afraid of that. They're afraid that Christians, Judeo-Christians, I might say, would wake up and quit worshiping the Jews and supporting the Jews. I mean, you understand what I'm saying here. Am I telling you the truth or am I telling you the truth? I'm telling you the truth. They're afraid of that. They're afraid of us gaining kingdom understanding and walking in that kingdom and living that kingdom. They saw small part of it when our pilgrim Puritan forefathers came here with a covenant vision, covenant understanding. And what happened there? It transformed this nation. It transformed the world even. But it really transformed and made a statement about the United States of America that they don't want and they're still trying to get rid of. Why are they hating Christ? Why are they trying to do away with His commandments? Why are they attacking Christianity? Right and left. What's that? They want the state as God. Yes. Statism. Well, I want kingdomism. <laughs> and so do you. And we can have it. We can have it if we'll believe it. Does it take faith? And walk in it. And live it. And live and have our being within it. Okay. Let us uh, go now to... um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, uh, move on to the communion aspect of this. I think I've laid enough of a foundation here for you to bring us into this area of communion right now. Are you ready? Let's begin by turning to Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. Chapter 60. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Let's go on now to verse 2. Let's just let that sink in. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness, the people. Think about it. Gross darkness, the people. Don't we see it upon the people? But the Lord shall arise upon thee. By the way, he's speaking to Israel here. And his glory shall be seen upon thee, Israel. What are we talking about here? The rapture. The rapture. Oh, I know it's a little hard for some of you to bite into that right now. But it's the rapture. The Lord will rise upon thee. The Lord shall arise upon thee. Double witness in here. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. Well, you have to be seen in order for His glory to be seen upon you. You have to walk in that light in order for His light to be seen. You have to be light bearers of His kingdom. Something's missing in Christianity today. Wouldn't you say so? 
Well, I just want to go down the aisle and I want to uh, sign my church membership and give my heart to Jesus and get saved and go get raptured off and go into the kingdom. Off in the old heaven. Off in the by and by. Leave it all behind. For what? That's how you want people to see the light of Christ? No wonder we're not Christians. No wonder the world is in darkness. No wonder the world has no desire for that. Do you understand what I'm saying here? What are you offering? What are you offering? Yes, we love Jesus. Yes, Jesus is our deliverer and our Savior. But if all we're doing it is calling Him Lord, Lord, and we're not pursuing the things of the kingdom, and we're not living the things of the kingdom, and the kingdom is reflected in our life, and our actions, and our behavior, forget it. If you're trying to be a kingdom unto yourself, forget it. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Isn't that what the Bible says? The kingdom of God is among you. Let it be seen among Christians. Let it be seen among Israel. No, pastor, we need to go out there and amalgamate and immigrate and do this and do that. And they'll see it in us. They'll see how loving we are by integrating ourselves with the world out there. Yeah, well, that's a lie. That's darkness. That's All that is, is mixing the name of Christianity, forms of Christianity, rituals of Christianity within it. It's not producing real kingdom, light and truth. As that kingdom grows and we have the right Israel biblical order established, the light will grow. Follow me? Listen, I'm not through here, but listen, get, let's get on the same page with Israel and the kingdom. The other nations, the other people will actually begin, begin to see that light and that's where nation transforming will emerge from. Not from Israel ex- rejecting who they are, pretending that it's so, we're all Israel today, that we're just spiritual Israel. If we're teaching the wrong gospel, if we're twisting the gospel with worldly love, you're not gonna, it's not going to emerge. You cannot have it. It's got to be true kingdom principles, true kingdom light, right? And as that happens, there is going to be a transformation. All right, let's move to... Um, 1 Corinthians 15, but I like that. The Lord is risen in thee. Arise, shine forth thy light. Wow. 1 Corinthians 15. All righty. And uh, let's start in verse 9. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then one of the twelve, many of the twelve disciples, right? After that He was seen above five hundred brethren at once. How many of you hear that before? 500 brethren also saw Christ? I think he got around a little bit, wouldn't you say? More than what people want us to think today. Witness, uh, Many witnesses saw him. 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain. They're still alive today. When Paul was writing this, he's saying, Unto this present, 
But some have fallen asleep. It means some have died. They're dead in the grave, asleep, waiting in the resurrection. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me. Paul saying, he was seen of me also, as of one born of due time. He says, I'm the least of the disciples. I persecuted the church of God. It goes on. But what is he speaking of? He's speaking of the glorious resurrection. Passover. You can't think of Passover hardly without praising him for his resurrection. He's our risen, resurrected Savior. He is our Passover. He's a sinless Lamb of God who sprinkled his blood, shall we say, upon the doorpost of our heart that we might have life and life more abundantly. He's our Passover lamb. Thinking of, the, uh, of what happened to the children of Israel at the time of Egypt, right? What a great time of deliverance. This is a great time of deliverance is also, this is another memorial, fantastic mark in Israel's history here. Another Another Egypt in the form of Christ dying upon the cross that we might have life and life more abundantly. All right, let's... Um, well, actually, before we, get, we move on here, uh, we need to understand some things about the resurrection. And that through the resurrection, we have what? Victory and hope in Christ. Again, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The kingdom, or the gospel of the kingdom message, is walking forth with the liberty we now have in Christ, proclaiming the kingdom of God. The hope. The hope of the world. But if they aren't given to see the kingdom through what the king did, Jesus Christ, you can't have that liberty and you can't walk in that liberty. You will not see the city manifest without that understanding. It just won't happen. Many are called and few are chosen to this. The covenant, the covenant people is made manifest, is given new light and new understanding in the resurrection. When we are baptized, when there is communion, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, He's not doing this so that we will just be glad in that ritual. He's doing this so we will understand the greater the greater truth, the greater blessing, the greater hope of Christ in you, the hope of glory. How many Christians partake of communion with that understanding and valuing Christ in you, the hope of glory? Not a lot. Not a lot. How many of them partake of it, putting that understanding of the kingdom of God into that? Or is it just a dead ritual to them? Or is it just a ritual to them? Or is there really life, meaning, and purpose beyond what the world sees or understands? That we're partaking of this because we are children of light. We understand that light. Because it's all about the resurrection again. The resurrection. What's the resurrection? The resurrection is taking dead, the dead, and giving it newness of life. The resurrection of the dead is so that we might have life and life more abundantly right now 
right now. We don't have to wait for our physical bodies to die. It's the spiritual man that needs to be brought alive. Okay. Christ and his kingdom. There's victory in Christ and his kingdom. There's victory in Christ and what he did upon the cross. We need to praise him for it. Uh, Let's go to quickly to 1 Corinthians 11 and let us pass out communion at this time please Um, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 Paul says for I have received of the Lord that I have delivered unto you that the Lord the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now, what is that blood? What it represent at the time of Egypt? Salvation, deliverance, translation. Out of the kingdom of Egypt, into the kingdom of God. Now, it was a physical form of it, we could say. It wasn't the fullness of the kingdom. It was the kingdom. He was bringing them into the kingdom. What's God Almighty been doing with His Israel people all along, bringing them into the kingdom. His desire is that they enter the kingdom. Ought to get an amen on that one. I want to enter the kingdom. So when we're partaking of communion here today, we are, yeah, yeah, we we need some communion too up here. (laughs) That's okay. Thank you all for doing this. We appreciate it. You all are wonderful. All righty. Thank you. So, he's saying this. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And this shows forth his death, meaning... He died so that we might have life and life more abundantly. A life outside of this world. His blood gives us life. His shed body, a type of the bread that He died upon the cross, He forsake that that we can have life, and life more abundantly, that we can be translated into His kingdom. When we partake of this, tough tough love here, we're partaking of it, that we understand that our body, our flesh, must be sacrificed as well to enter into His kingdom. I didn't say, please understand what I'm saying here. I didn't say go out and kill yourselves. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your carnal mind. I die daily, Paul said, has to die. And as that dies, kingdom light, kingdom truth will arise within us. And there's going to be a new day dawning, the likes of which we will shout and praise Him for. And the world will even, oh my gosh, the world's going to be transformed too. But we have to be transformed first. We're the first fruits. We're the first fruits. So let's partake of communion at this time. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this understanding of the kingdom. We thank you for this spiritual, deep spiritual understanding of your shed blood and your body that you willingly sacrifice for upon the cross 
because you knew and understood the greater glory even though many people do not. We thank you for your love. We thank you for true love. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. We are your friends. We are your servant people. You lay down your life for us for that treasure. And in that love and in that sacrifice, the world is going to be swallowed up. The world has no choice. You've won. You're the victor. And there is a victory and an understanding of that victory that is going to blow people's minds. I don't know any other way to describe it, Lord Jesus. But I pray that this communion and all the fullness of the Holy Spirit and, and that spiritual transformation and that spiritual change and, and understanding and renewal may take place in our lives here today and those that are partaking of communion now.